Awesome, guys. Well, here's the thing. I got to get to work because there's a lot to talk about and not that much time. And so we're going to jump right into it. This is our time in the Word. I want to encourage you not to step away, not to draw back, but instead uh, to press in. We believe that God moves on our hearts and in our lives through these words as we research and as we explore them together. With that in mind, now, who can finish this phrase? Life and death are in the power of the... There's a few good Christians here. All right. Let's see if we can get some more good Christians in here right real quick, all right? I'm going to do it again. I'm going to give you a second chance so we can, so you can show how good of a Christian you are, all right? Ready? Uh, who can finish this phrase? Life and death are in the power of the... Ah, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good there. And here's the thing. Why am I asking you that? Well, that is actually a Proverbs, Proverbs 18, 21. If you never knew where that came from, that's where it came from. However, the main reason I'm even bringing it up is because from ancient days up until now, humanity has always believed that words matter. We have always believed that words matter. Whether the days of curses and spells that felt so prominent in ancient days, and if you are on the up, may be more prominent today than we like to think, but nonetheless felt more widely practiced in days of old, to the understanding of trauma and words as violence that we oftentimes hear about today, right? People have always believed that words, our language, what we say has an extreme impact on us. Some would even describe it as a power, as a power over us. In many ways, and for many people, so much power that speech actually and things that we've heard and things that have been told to us actually define us. And here's the thing, this subject can feel quite heavy. I introduced it in a sort of heavy way, but it's not always heavy. It's not always heavy. In fact, sometimes it could be quite comedic, right? In fact, one of the funniest places I've personally seen this at work is right here, right? This guy. Who knows who this guy is? Will Ferrell, but who's this character? Ricky Bobby. All right, Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby, one of the funniest movies of the 2000s. In particular, where I see this most at work is in this scene right here, the scene where Will Ferrell, a.k.a. Ricky Bobby, is in a wheelchair. And if you don't know the story, Ricky Bobby has a crash. This is spoiler alerts, but also movies like 20 years old, so it's your fault. All right, he has a crash, and he has this incredible mental breakdown as a result of the crash. And they go and visit him, his crew chief and his best friend, uh, these two individuals, they go and visit him just to see him in a wheelchair. And then his, his crew chief, Lucius Washington, looks at the doctor and says, tell me, doc, is he ever going to walk again? To which the doctor replies, oh, uh, oh, he's fine. He found that wheelchair in the hallway, but we don't want to break his concentration because he's very fragile right now, so we're all just going with it. Soon after that, we find this scene where Lucius uh, and his best, and, and Ricky's best friend, what's this guy's name? Y'all remember his name? Cal, oh, jeez, okay. Cal uh, are in there, and, and they're, they're coming to terms and trying to talk to Ricky Bobby, but Ricky has these really agitated responses to him, and one of those responses, right in the crescendoing moment, I'm going to read it to you. He looks at his two friends, and he says, I hope that both of you have sons, handsome, beautiful, articulate sons who are talented and star athletes, and, and they have their legs taken away. I mean, I pray you know that pain and that hurt, to which... Lucius Washington looks back at Ricky Bobby, and what does he say? Oh, man, come on, y'all. Say it with your chest. That was your moment to say that with your chest. To which Lucius Washington looks back at Ricky Bobby and says, Don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. That's right. Don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. There it is. Shortly after that, they tell him, you can walk, to which you guys know the end of the story. Ricky Bobby stabbed himself in the leg, soon learning that he, in fact, is fine. <laughs> and here's the thing. Lucius, in a comedic way, believes that Ricky's delusional, immature, ignorant words, that even those words have some kind of power. It's funny, but it's actually kind of powerful. A delusional, immature rather dumb man is spouting off things that don't matter and are from a delusional place and are immature. And yet, even in that moment, Lucius Washington, who seems, for all intents and purposes, the most mature character in the whole movie, he looks back and says, that has power, right? Don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. 
right? Here's the thing, though. Lucius is actually a lot of us. We believe that words themselves have power, that no matter the person saying them, no matter their maturity level, no matter their intention, no matter their role or their priority in our lives, the words that they say have power power. And so we've walked around our entire lives with deep scars and wounds related to the words that people have spoken to us. And we spend huge chunks of our life wrestling with those very words. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, because I believe scripture, in particular the Proverbs, I believe that it has a lot to say about the power of language, the power of speech. We just actually started this sermon by quoting a proverb that life and death are in the power of the tongue. And today, as we continue our sermon series in Proverbs, we're going to be examining why speech is powerful, why it uplifts, and why it also can damage us at times. And what we can do in response to those moments when it feels like speech hurts. And so as we begin, we're going to go ahead and read our text for the day. And what I want to invite you to do is to stand with me if you're able. You're standing out of respect for these words that many of us believe, again, are not just words, but are given to us by God. We're going to read them together. Uh, you can read them along with me if you like. After that, I am going to say, this is the word of the Lord, in which case I'm inviting you to respond, thanks be to God, in this traditional response to public reading that connects us to the church for generations. But with that in mind, we're going to read Proverbs 10, 19 through 21, and it reads uh, like this. I'm going to read from over here. When there are many words, sin is unavoidable, but the one who controls his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is pure silver. The heart of the wicked is of little value. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. This is the word of the Lord. You can have a seat. Now, let's get to the nitty gritty. What's happening here? All right, as we discussed last week, chapter 10 begins a change in the Proverbs uh, where most scholars agree this is, these are most certainly Solomon's Proverbs, Solomon's wisdom, or at least wisdom can be associated with Solomon. You might remember that when we began talking about Proverbs, we talked about the fact that Proverbs is a collection of wisdom writing. So not all of it has the same author. Uh, in the first 10 chapters, uh, despite being referenced Solomon, uh, there is not universal agreement about who wrote those 10 chapters. It may have even been the person that collected and put all the Proverbs together. But chapter 10 begins a transition where we very much believe this is who wrote this. These are, at least this is who's associated with this wisdom, Solomon. Now, uh, but the collection of these books was really, from the beginning, given, uh, formed, and collected in order to give us a vision of how to live life or how to live a life filled with wisdom. And you guys know, because uh, we've been talking about it for several weeks, wisdom is what? Who remembers? It starts with an S. The S. The skill of living. All right, we're going to have to go through this seriously. This is our, I know this is week five, uh, and as I've been saying it every week. And so we're going to go through it right now, right? Wisdom is the skill of living. I'm going to do it again. Wisdom is the skill of living. All right, we're going to do it one more time. Wisdom is the skill of That's right. That's right. Wisdom from Scripture's perspective is this skill, this learned ability of a living life that is in line with God's ways and God's designs. It's no wonder then that Proverbs tackles the idea of talking, of speaking, right? People talk. We talk a lot. Fam, you and I, and particularly I, right, talk a massive amount. And particularly some of you also talk an enormous amount. We as people love talking. Not only, maybe you can limit it and say, well, I don't talk that much. I bet you all that time you're not talking to others. You are inside your head talking to yourself. You love talking. You love talking. I love talking. Okay, in fact, uh, Nielsen and Scholastic did a study. This is how much we like talking. That be, as the studies have shown over the last 10 or 15 years, that as one other medium has gotten much more popular, the idea of a reading has gone down substantially. What do you think that medium is? Say it again. Podcasts, is, they are on, podcasts are on there, but it's a specific platform. Starts with a Y. YouTube, right? As YouTube, podcasts, things, that, things where we don't just read, where we watch people talk. Right? Even listening to people talk is more preferred than reading. So there's been this weird trend where reading is less and television, YouTube, TikTok, things are more. 
And that makes sense because, again, we love talking. Hearing people talk, it's a huge part of our lives. As a result, though, Proverbs, speaking of how to live wisely, right, the, the wisdom authors here, they have to address it. And so they do. In 10, chapter, nine, chapter 10, verse 19. Hey, where there's a lot of words, sin is unavoidable, right? But the righteous person's tongue is like choice silver. But the heart of the wicked is worth very little. What's the main point here? Well, Solomon's main point, this is adapted uh, from scholar Bruce Waltke's summary, but Bruce Waltke's summary is a little, little heady, so just change a couple of words. But, but the main point of this text is actually this. Whereas a lot of words from the careless mean little, even a few love-filled words from a godly person can give life. That that's the automatic thought from the wisdom authors about speaking. That words themselves are influential, but even a lot of words from a careless person, those words are relatively worthless. But just a few words from a godly, love-filled words from a godly person, those can bring life. How do we arrive at this point? How does Walty arrive at this point? Well, this is where things get special and where things get a little nerdy, okay? I'm not gonna lie to you. Because this is where we see uh, that there may be something more going on in this verse than just telling you uh, to say something nice or don't say anything at all, right? That's the power of work, uh, power of language some of us feel, right? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. But, but there's more happening in this proverb than, than just that sort of idea, right? The heart of this verse uh, it actually all comes together in verse 20. And in verse 20, there's a literary technique that's called a chiasm, all right? You don't have to repeat chiasm, all right? But it's, it's a literary technique called a chiasm. Now, the next question you had was, what in the world is a chiasm? And I'm here to tell you, all right? So a chiasm is a literary technique a little bit like a ladder, right? Maybe there's a section of text, and at one end, there's a parallel point to the other end of the ladder. So the first verse and the last verse, they kind of communicating an echoing point. And then from there, the points just keep going, paralleling each other from the beginning and the end until they get to the middle. And the verse in the middle is like the main point of the chiasm, right? So if that doesn't make sense, let's just take a look here, and I think it'll make sense once you start seeing it. But where is the chiasm in verse 20? And here's the thing. In our English Bibles, the chiasm, the laddered point in verse 20 is actually really hard to really hard to identify. Because while our English versions may say something like the righteous person's tongue is choice silver, the heart of the wicked is worth little, that's good English. It's also good poetry. That's, that's parallelism. It's trying to create two points for you to understand. And they're trying to put it in good English because it's like, hey, here's how you can understand it. In Hebrew, the sentence is structured more like this. The sentence goes, no, no, back one, bro. The sentence is structured, choice silver is the tongue of the righteous the heart of the wicked is worth little. And so if you see, there's two points in the front end and in the back that mean very, very similar things. One is worth a lot. The other is worth very little. What is the one that is worth a lot? The tongue of the righteous. What is the one that's worth a little? The heart of the wicked. So the main point then is what? That the tongue of the righteous person is a good thing. It's a life-giving thing. It's powerful. It's beautiful. And the heart of the wicked person is worth very little. Now, you might be asking, like, yeah, I could have got that without all this. You're right. However, however, where this actually starts to break down even further and becomes much more powerful and, and starts to communicate what, what I think and what many think the authors are trying to communicate is found once you see the Hebrew words in this verse. So if you go back to, uh, yeah, there we go. The Hebrew word for tongue is lashon. And the Hebrew word for heart is lev. And so if you keep going in this alliteration, if you, I mean, if you keep going in this chiasm, there is this alliteration that we find kind of at the, at the culmination of this verse, right? Choice is the lashon of the righteous. The, the heart, the lev of the wicked is worth little. And right here, tell me what these two, these two words, at least for us English speakers, have in common. L. Lashon and lev. And here's the thing. If you were reading this as a Hebrew reader, without the English interpretations and, and what we're doing to try to make it, sense, make it make sense to us, that would have stood out to you because it, it would have been unique. It would have sounded, it would have made you kind of perk up and go, what does that mean? 
Why is it like that? And here's the thing, the reason it's like that is because the author intends to connect heart and language. That the heart and the mouth are intimately connected. The heart produces and motivates the words that come out of our mouth and the words that come out of our mouth reveal our heart. They are intrinsically connected. In fact, some would say they are inseparable. And this is the place that the author wants to bring us. This specific place that your heart is intrinsically connected to your mouth and your heart and your mouth is intrinsically connected to your heart is exactly where the author wants to bring us. And the reason for that is clear, right? There's, there's gonna be a, a slide with this on there because I want you to remember it, right? The proverbs around language aren't meant to restrict our speech but challenge our hearts. And this is critically important for you to realize. Because it's easy to read Proverbs and instruction about language in the Bible and think that that's telling you not to cuss, when in reality, it's telling you not to, not to spew death, destruction, division, hatred out of your mouth. And you may be so confident that you're not cussing, but that doesn't mean that what's coming out of your mouth is life. You may not cuss, but man, you, you may spew destruction. Those two things, those two things are not the same thing. And understanding this is paramount to living uh, in a way that brings life. Understanding that the proverbs around speech are, meant, are not meant to restrict our speech, but challenge our hearts. This proverb isn't placing priority on what you say, but what motivates what you say. What do you love? What do you hate? What do you practice? Because what you say may be received very differently based on things like tone, intent, context. The heart animates our language in ways that go beyond the basic meaning of a word. And I'm gonna say that again, it's important for you to understand what I'm saying. The heart animates, it brings life to a word way more than a definition. Way more than anything else, our heart animates and gives life to words. I mean, probably the most extreme example of this, and I'm hoping y'all don't slay me, is to be quite honest, profanity. Profanity is probably the most explicit example of this particular type of uh, teaching. Why? In comedy, there are times that using certain profane words, let's be honest, you gonna be real with me, I'm gonna be real with you, it just makes things funnier, big dog. <laughs> like, there, there are times where it just makes things funnier. It just does. There are times where if you had heard a certain joke without that expletive in it, it just would not have been as funny as when you listened to it with the expletive in it. However, there's a plain and obvious difference between those moments of levity and fun and someone cursing at you in an aggressive way while you're in a road rage incident. Same exact words, same exact four letter words, right? It's a very different context. More than that, there's also a difference in using profanity, right, when someone smashes their toe. I rearranged my living room a couple weeks ago. Things are in new spots. I ain't gonna front with you. Talking to me right now, all right? When you smash your toe, you blurt out some four-letter word. That is also very different than cursing someone and, and treating them poorly or making a joke and, and yet also there's, there's likewise a very different experience when you smash your toe compared to when someone experiences disappointment or heartbreak. And what animates those moments is not the words themselves, it's the heart and the motivation behind those words, right? This proverb is telling us that words are meant to bring life. And I want you to listen to what I'm saying. This will also be on the board. Ian, if you ain't throwing it on the board, please throw it on the board. All right, this proverb is telling us that words are meant to bring life not because words themselves are so powerful, but because the godly, healthy person, right, or godly, healthy people bring life. That's the point of this verse. If you think that this verse is trying to say, uh, don't speak foul, then you have completely missed the point. Because the verse is not trying to restrict your language. It's trying to challenge your heart. Because words themselves don't break your bones. Right, but godly people, they bring life, even with just a few words that the power behind those words is not the words themselves, right? But the power of a godly, loving person, even using a few words, can change someone's life and can bring restoration and redemption to that person. This actually links us back to last week's sermon, 
right? He, the person, um, is a path to life who heeds instruction. The person who heeds instruction is a path to life. That's what we talked about last week, right? In a lot of ways, speech is a reflection of that. When our speech is used to love someone, right? When our speech is used to bring life, we become a path to life for someone else. And here's the thing, this, this is, there's two critical ways I, I wanna highlight in, in terms of why this is important for us. First, I want you to consider obviously what this means for those around you. How your language impacts the people around you. Your words are meant to bring life. They're not meant to bring life because you're so whimsical. You may be whimsical. They're not meant to bring life because you're so winsome and articulate. Maybe you are winsome and articulate. And then here's the other part that's encouraging to that, is that maybe you're not. Maybe you're not whimsical. Maybe you're not articulate. Maybe you're not winsome. That's okay. That's okay. Because what actually makes the words powerful is not the words themselves, but the motivation behind the words. And so maybe you're not winsome, whimsical, and articulate, but the actual a feeling, the feeling of love that comes from someone that just uses a few words, the feeling of love that comes from someone that looks at you and earnestly says, I'm sorry. The one that looks at you and says, I'm here for you. And you know that they're not messing around, right? This isn't whimsical, winsome, fluffy words. This is a person who loves you and is there for you and is present for you. When those words hit you, they bring life. Why? Because they're different than what almost someone else said. No, because the heart delivering those words brings life. It heals, restores. Your desire for them is good. That's why we said earlier the main point is even a few love-filled words can bring life. There's not a formula for this, friends. I'm not going to stand up here and be like, give someone a con, a, a, what's it called? Uh, it's, it's the sandwich where you got to give a compliment sandwich. I'm not going to be up here and be like, give the compliment sandwiches. That's the formula for loving speech. No, it's not. Because there have been people that have looked and said, I deeply disagree with you. I have nothing really good to say, but I love you and I need you to change. And that friend is evidence of someone who loves you, not just someone who hates you. And then there's other people who are your enemies that will never tell you a single bad thing about you. And their words are like honey, but guess what? They do nothing for you. So there's not a formula for this, right? Loving someone is the actual fuel for this type of life change that comes with words. Loving someone and caring for them, that's what actually does it. And here's the thing, we can see this through a variety of different types of communication. Think about humor, right? If you think about humor, I love, I, y'all know I love humor. I struggle to be serious enough. Until I have to be serious, in which case I will get, and some of y'all have seen me get really serious, and you're like, well, God, my kid just asked Jude how serious I'd be getting that brother be coming in like, that man gets serious, bro. You don't mess with him, right? At the same time, right, friendly, loving jokes, even when they seem mildly offensive, even if they may seem mildly crude, can be loving because the desire behind them is to see the other person laugh. The desire behind them is to see the other person lifted up from their sorrows or from their discouragement, right? And I know there are lines to this. I'm not saying there's not. I'm not saying go say whatever you want. I likewise can listen to a comedian and be like, ah, I'm gonna turn this off. This isn't doing nothing for me right now. But here's the thing, we can feel the difference. Difference with what? Well, the difference that on the other hand, we can feel when someone is joking to someone else making fun of us, right? Saying mean things, hurting us, bringing themselves joy at our expense. And therein lies the difference. Right? We can feel when someone else is making fun of us at our expense for the sake of their own joy. But we can also feel when someone is saying something that may even be a little crude, may even be a little bit shocking, but you can tell their only intent is not to make or belittle someone else, but to just make you laugh. They just want to see you happy for a second. We can feel, we can feel the difference. Similar words, maybe even at times the same words, very different heart. The words of Thomas Carlyle, he's a Scottish essayist, poet, and philosopher. He said this about humor that I love. He said, true humor springs not more from the head than from the heart. It is not contempt. Its essence is love. Right? When you're bountifully laughing with somebody, probably because they look at you and really want you to laugh. They really want you to be encouraged. 
Speaking of encouragement, encouragement is another version of, of communication of speech that we can see this dynamic in, right? I believe in you. I'm here for you, right? Man, we'll work together. Right? That's very different than is that the best you can do? You're so lazy. Both of them probably tr like have some idea of trying to motivate you. Some of them probably have some idea of trying to push you forward. One of them does it with probably very little care about your heart and mental condition and more about the product. The other one is looking at you, concerned about the whole of your person. And then so they're saying, hey, I believe in you. Let's do it together. Instruction is another. We talked about instruction last week. Instruction is another place we can see this dynamic, right? You come alongside somebody, here's how you do it. I'm going to show you how to do it once. I'm going to watch you do it the next time. And then I'm going to see you do it on your own the third time, right? That type of instruction paired with a gentle, loving spirit can be really powerful. It teaches people how to move forward. It teaches people how to live life. It teaches people the skill of living versus, God, you can't do anything right. You're so stupid. You are so dumb. Two very different things, both trying to instruct the other person, one of them doing it with love, one of them doing it without love. Now, how can we see this in like a very practical way? Uh, on Friday night, uh, my, my mom uh, came over to practice their kids and whatnot, and me and my wife go on, on a date night. And where we go uh, is we go to the Hillside Theater, because who knows what's going on at the Hillside Theater right now? Legally Blonde, Legally Blonde. I'm not, I'm gonna let you know, it wasn't even my wife's idea, it was my idea. <laughs> I'm just playing, I'm just kidding. I'll say, I'll say that before, before Friday night, I wasn't a Legally Blonde fan. As I watched it, I was like, this kind of slaps. I ain't gonna lie, it's kind of, Elle Woods is in there hidden. So I was like, I'm an I'm a Elle Woods fan now. But as you go through the story, again, uh, we're, what are they called? Spoiler alerts, that movie also 20 years old, also your fault, okay? Through the, through the movie, Elle Woods goes to Harvard Law School in pursuit of getting back her man, whatever his name is. Uh, through the course of time, she's there just to say, I want to get my man back. She's not worried about a law degree. She's not worried about any of that. She just wants to get her man back. But as she's working through uh, things, she meets Paulette Bonafonte, uh, who is her hairdresser, who is tied up in this weird situation with her, her salon uh, and her ex-husband. And so she's at the, on the verge of losing this salon and X, Y, and Z. And at least in the musical, I've not really watched the movie like that, but in the musical, Elle Woods uses the things she's been learning in law school, and she comes over to uh, the ex-husband's house, uh, Paulette Bonafonte's ex's house, and she gives this incredible little speech, and she gets the dog back, and she, the, which there's a dog involved, that's a really random, that may be the whole point of it, I'm not sure, but what I am getting at is that she does this thing where when she puts practice, she puts what she's been learning in law school into practice, and what actually happens at the end of that is what caught my attention. Because at the end of that, there is this scene, and the actress did an incredible job. She walked over to the side, and she said, is this what law is? And she said, is this what law is for? To help those on the margins and to help them come back and be restored, right? Is that what law is about? And this is like a big shift in the story. Because while Elle Woods thought she was going to Harvard Law in order to get a man back, she realized that the purpose of law is much better than the simple idea of getting this guy back. She understands what it's actually for. And here's the thing, friends, once we experience what speech is for, I think it's a lot like Elle Woods. All right, this is, this is what my speech is for, it's to bring life. Right, it's to encourage the discouraged. Right, it's to bring hope to the hopeless. It's to bring strength to the weak. It's to bring justice to the marginalized. It's to bring forgiveness to the repentant. I didn't know that. I thought my mouth, I thought my words were here for my pleasure. But it turns out when we start to see what they're meant for, like a woods, it's like going, it's like a whole new world. Your language becomes a whole new world. And your words have so much more meaning than you thought they did before because your heart is animating them in a completely different way. Your heart is motivating your words in a completely different way. Now, the second thing that I wanna highlight in terms of how this is impactful is that this is deep uh, here, so I want you to prepare yourself, but 
I want you to think about what this means for, for those of us uh, who have been hurt by others' words, okay? Uh, I want you to think about it. This is you, those people that have piled on things like disappointment, anger, disapproval, or even just like hate and malice onto you. And for many of us, here's the thing, we carry these moments around with us, right? We have been carrying them, some of us, for decades. And you've defined yourself, maybe I've defined myself by that person saying that they're disappointed or they're angry or that person that makes you feel dumb or that person that belittles you. And some of us, believing that it was those words that have impacted us, have sought to wage war against those moments with competing words and ideas. I'm not stupid. No, no, no. In fact, I'm smart. I'm, I'm not worthless. In fact, I'm, I'm valuable. I'm not lazy. No, I'm, I'm hardworking. And for some of us, going to the furthest extent, we have tried our entire lives to fight that battle and to prove those words wrong, to prove that person wrong. And friend, what does this proverb tell us that are in that camp? So what I think it tells us, that it was never their words that hurt you in the first place. It was their heart that hurt you. It was never their words that hurt you in the first place. It was their heart that hurt you. When that person should have encouraged you and built you up, they put you down. They benigned you. They marginalized you, hurt you. When that person should have instructed you, they were angry with you. It was never just their words that hurt you. It was always their heart that hurt you. And here's why this is important for you. Because if it wasn't their words, but their heart that hurt you, then it's not going to be mere words that heal you. Listen to what I just said, because what I just said is incredibly important for those of us wrestling with this. If it wasn't their words, but their heart that hurt you, then it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be mere words that heal you. If you're hoping that words are going to heal you, that you're going to repeat something over and over again, and that in and of itself is going to somehow restore you, that in and of itself is going to make things better, friend, those words don't have power. That's the whole point of this proverb, is yes, words are powerful, but only once we're understood through the lens of the fact that people make them powerful, that hearts that animate them positively, negatively, lovingly, hatefully, positively, compassionately, angrily, right? That's what animates and gives power to words. And it's not gonna be mere words that heal you. It's not going to be words, but a heart that heals you. It's going to be a heart that heals you. And here's the thing. In Scripture, I don't think there is a single place where words unveil a heart and where a heart motivates words like the man on the cross. I don't think there's a single place. A man who's being spit on, carrying a cross for the very sins of the people that are spitting on him. And saying things like, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's gnarly. That's crazy. But the Gospels are littered with this exact type of speech. The Gospels are littered with Jesus, his heart motivating words that should bring life to those around him. One of my absolute favorite stretches of scripture is in Luke 15. When Jesus, telling a story says this, in Luke 15, verses 1 through 10, I don't think it's going to be on the screen, but I want you to listen to the reading. I want you to listen to the words. I want you to think about them. Luke 15, 1 starts, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Friends, what man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together 
saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Or what woman who has 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the entire house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. I want you to hear those words. Those words are powerful. Those words are beautiful. Those words invite us in our failure to return to one. And I love that even at the end of verse 10 there, he says the angels in heaven rejoice. It's not because they went and found out, it's because the owner of the coin goes and tells them that he has found the coin. It's because God himself goes to the angels and says, I have found the one who's lost. And everyone rejoices in glory. Those words are powerful. Those words get even more powerful. Because after that, what you guys may not know is Luke 15 is actually where the prodigal son is found. The prodigal son is a crescendo of those first two stories. It's like bringing those first two stories, putting them all together, and saying, yeah, it's like a sheep and a shepherd. It's like a woman and a coin, but actually it's like a father. It's like a father whose son turns his back on him and is lost. And when that son returns, he does not return as a slave, but his father celebrates, receives him, and restores him. Right? Powerful words. Stories that have echoed for 2,000 years in the hearts of people that have listened to them. Now, having said all the things we've said, I want to ask you, why are they so powerful then? Why are they so powerful then? Are they just eloquent words said to people that need a fancy speech? Or are they words that are motivated by a God who would leave glory in order to pursue those that he loves? Pursue anything, even death, even death on a cross, so that he could have what is rightfully his, his sons and daughters restored back to him, to have a life-giving relationship with him, and to be made whole through his presence, his love, and his ministry. Tell me what makes those words powerful, if not the God whose heart animates those very words. Friend, that's what makes language powerful. And it may be that in your life you have wrestled through incredibly difficult moments where people have said incredibly hard things to you and where people's hearts have animated words that have scarred you and left you hurting and limping for the last year, 5, 10, 20, 30, 60 years. And if that is the case, I want to say with the utmost sincerity, I am so sorry. You were not made for that. You were not crafted for that. The hand of your creator did not form you with the design and anticipation and hope that people's unloving hearts would form and animate words that hurt you. That was never his will and desire and plan in terms of the designs of the world. But what was a part of his plans was to enter into the stories that we just read. What was always a part of his plans, right, the moment sin appeared was to enter into the story and to begin to animate words that reveal a heart to you that is going to be the very heart that brings healing to you. 
that the words of Scripture, the stories of Jesus, the declarations of his love, his forgiveness, his compassion, and his mercy are not just meant to be good stories and fun things to read on a Sunday or on a, a nighttime read, but they are meant to be words that reveal the heart of a God who would give everything for you because he loves you, because he made you, and what he wants nothing more than anything in the entire world and universe is for you to be his daughter or his son and for him to be your father and your God, that that is the ultimate goal of this story. And as a result, it may not be words that you need to bring healing, but it is a heart that you need to bring healing, but it's the heart of a father who's done everything to make you his. And it's in that very relationship with that very heart that I think a lot of healing can come to you and to me. That's why speech is so powerful, friend, because it reveals a heart. That's why God's word is so powerful, because it reveals his heart for you. And so our two points today, right? Scripture, right? I mean, not scripture. Our words breathe it. They bring life because our heart animates. A loving, affectionate heart is, it animates words. That means a lot for those around you, but it also means a lot for you. We talked about a lot in the, probably the past like 10 minutes to 12 minutes here. And I, I want to encourage you that if you're, if you have had moments over the course of the last 12 minutes that have stirred you up and brought a tear to your eye, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to some of the things that we talked about over the last like 12 to 13 minutes. Because I'll be honest, in my notes, I wrote down like I probably need to like talk about this again at length of the whole like sermon. But I think those are really important. With that in mind though, I do wanna I do want to finish up, but I do want to give you two pieces of practical, valuable encouragement, takeaways, right? The first one is this. Uh, this is obvious when we just start talking about take the pains of your heart to the man on the cross. Right? The pains of your heart, there are definitely Definitely, it is necessary to share the burdens of your heart with those that have maybe hurt you. I'm not saying not to do that. I'm saying that if you take the pains of your heart to the people that hurt you, and you expect that they are going to be the fountain of life for that pain, then you are going to be deeply disappointed. You are going to be deeply disappointed. I'm not telling you shouldn't share those things and you shouldn't seek reconciliation. But again, if you're banking on them being what makes you whole and restores your heart, you're going to be disappointed. And so rather than going to them and saying, can you bring life by being reconciled to me? Go to the man on the cross, receive his heart, be restored through him, and then seek reconciliation with them. Let that be the sequence of how you're conducting yourself, right? Because if you go to them, it's going to be a mess. If that's your primary means of restoration, it's going to be a mess. The second thing is, is challenging, but I, I need to say it, is that I want to encourage you to, to work to recognize the difference between words that hurt your feelings and a heart that hurt your feelings or a heart that hurt you. Because here's the thing, after that, you need to let love cover the difference in those two things. What do I mean by that? Is that there are absolutely some people in this room with good reason to leave behind certain relationships with loved ones, parents, exes, family members, those reasons usually involve the heart of the other person being hardened or incapable of doing the duty of loving and caring for you or that person that left the situation behind. However, however, there are some of us in here that God may be inviting you to see that you are hurt about words, not about heart. That your burden is with how someone says something and the fact that they said something not what their heart behind it was. Some of us are mad about people's words and haven't even considered their heart. And it's possible there are some relationships waiting to be restored because you recognize the heart instead of the words. There may be some relationships in your lives, in my life, in your life, that are waiting to be restored and reconciled because you a kind of like a, a, a aha moment, see someone's heart instead of just seeing their words. And once you see the heart that loves you instead of the words that you felt hated you, right, that's a fountain that forgiveness and reconciliation can come from. I think that is a fountain that we can actually find restoration in. The one that's filled with anger or malice or bitterness, that is not one that we oftentimes can pull reconciliation out from. 
It's just not. It never is. I don't know if you've tried, but it's not, you know, it just doesn't happen. It's like a, a, a broken fountain drink machine, right? Good things don't come from it. But if you can see the difference, it may be that God's inviting you to have some relationships reconciled and restored once you learn and understand the heart behind the person that said the things you're upset about. With that in mind, um, let's pray, and then, uh, then we'll take communion together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that your word so beautifully communicates to us about our words, about how important they are. Thank you, Father, though, that this is not some arbitrary say this, not that, you shouldn't say this, but, but rather your word is not meant to restrict or prohibit our speech as much as it is meant to challenge our hearts to challenge our hearts for the sake of those around us, but also to inform us about what we're deeply heard about and then to encourage us as you point us to the heart that's revealed on the cross. And so thank you, Father, for your work. Thank you uh, for your life. Thank you for the restoration that comes in, in being reconciled to you and in knowing your heart for us. I love you. I thank you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.